very much for, for asking me to speak. Um, I want to explain to you why I think congregations are such interesting uh, and fascinating places and people, uh, and, uh, and I want to find out something of your experience as well. Um, before I begin, I have a few little pictures. If I'm actually standing in your line of vision and you want to shuffle, that, that's fine, but to move a bit. Um, they're, they're, not, they're just for you to look at, really, a bit of kind of visual entertainment while I, while I talk. Um, as Edward said, I work in the diocese as the late development advisor. Though I've been ordained for 27 years now, um, I'm uh, really, really passionate about lay and ordained people working together so that the church isn't too clerical. Because otherwise it will just, you know, just, just become a, a means of paying the clergy. That might be what the church ends up in. You know, if we don't have a good balance between lay and ordained. And so I'm doing some study at the moment for a, what's called a professional doctorate. A professional doctorate is a reflection on one's own practice. Where I read and study and then say, what is that saying about the way that I act and do my work? Um, and I'm looking at uh, relationships between ordained and lay leaders in the church. I'll tell you a bit more about that later on. That's why I'm very interested to have uh, some of your wisdom, because uh, I have been having the opportunity to uh, consult with a number of people along the way during the study. And over the summer holidays, Edward was one of those who came to my house and I said, I'll give you lunch if you read my paper. <laughs> uh, so I think that's I think it's come from come from that that I'm here. Uh, so why why study congregations? Well, plenty of reasons that people study congregations. Sometimes because they are anthropologists um, and they want to study a small exotic tribe <laughs> of distinct people with unusual beliefs and they can't get the funding to go overseas. <laughs> and that's certainly been the reason. There's been a lot more anthropologists actually looking at their own culture and saying, what are we doing here, rather than travelling off to the, the South Seas or wherever. Um, and so, so let's actually study what people are doing in this country. And a congregation, a small, exotic tribe with strange beliefs. It seems to fit the bill. And so there's, there's sociologists of religion have turned their attention to churches and to congregations. How do ordinary people express their faith? What's going on week by week, Sunday by Sunday? It's one of the reasons why people are looking at congregations. Or maybe it's because people love historic buildings. If you adore historic buildings, and you can't afford all the entrance fees, or you find things that are always shut or privately owned. Mm. Well, I know what's going on inside the church. Mm. So that's another reason why people express their interest in congregations. <coughs> Perhaps though you're worried about the future of the church, the declining numbers attending to church, you want to investigate what's happening in local churches, and that's the reason you're studying congregations. Perhaps you believe that the credibility of the gospel depends on the health of the local congregation. You've only got to look at recent literature to see that a lot of people think that. A lot of books on health and congregations. You think nobody's going to believe the Christian faith unless they see what it means in practice to be a Christian. So that makes a congregation a good thing to understand and to know about. Perhaps you think that the most significant thing that anyone can do, especially a Christian can do, is to pray for the world and to celebrate Christ's death and resurrection in the Eucharist. You believe that. You want to go to the place where it's happening, the intercession and the Eucharist. And that's in the congregation. So I hope that for all these reasons and more, you see that the question, what is a congregation, is a significant one. But it is, a, it is a question that I think for up until very recently, Anglicans have been quite kind of reluctant to ask, mm -hmm. just in case anybody accuses them of that most un-Anglican thing of being congregationalist. <laughs> Horrible last word. Um, and, and, so, <coughs> and so I know somebody who wrote a book uh, about uh, eight years ago, they called it studying local churches. Mm. It's all about studying congregations. Mm. 
But they thought they put congregations on the title, people wouldn't buy it because they they shy away. I think that reluctance is weakening. And people are saying, even within the Church of England, we really must understand the life of congregations as a body of people. We've got to know how they're formed and how they're behaving. Traditional Anglican ecclesiology has put the parish, Roaring, has put the parish, um, which is a territorial space with a parish church at its centre. That's been right at the heart of Anglican ecclesiology. The building and what goes on it has been traditionally a repository of the needs of the whole community. And through intercessory prayer, hosting the occasional offices, and seasonal services like Harvest and Christmas and Remembrance Sunday, it served the needs of everyone resident in the parish. And in these ways, the parish church and its regular congregation have accepted responsibility for the spiritual welfare of the community. The building and the graveyard have been treated as communal space. People rally round when there's something to be done. Turning up to keep the graveyard clean, for example. At Roroth, we have inferno days, which we put in the local, um, the local news. And you come and slash something down. Hack and, it's a hack and slash day, really, and burn. Uh, and, and, and we, we clean up. And people turn up to keep the graveyard clean. And there's a bit of land just down the road, which the council put there about 40 years ago. And they sort of, sort of put some kind of memorial there. And every time there's a, a local um, parish meeting, the non-church parish meeting, there are complaints that nobody's looking after that space. But it doesn't belong to anybody's hearts in the way that the graveyard does. It's really never been the case that everybody went to church in the past, but perhaps in the past people knew which church they were meant to go to. So maybe you know a church like this, a communal church owned and attended by a range of groups for whom the church is their sacred space. It might be in a rural area, it might be in, this, in, a, in a city in a very clearly defined <coughs> territory but a communal church. It's more likely, actually, that you know a gathered or an associational church. Members travel to it for the particular kind of worship or, or the children's work or, or something else. And, and the regular folk, the regular congregation, are those who feel that they really belong. Um, if you recognise this church, I'm not making any comments about this particular church, uh, just that the car park is really important because people are travelling to church. So they're a good car park. And folk don't meet each other outside of church. They pray for the world out there. They may try to help some of the local community, but they're helping them as though they are visitors, not, not residents. Um, the beneficiaries of all this goodwill are, are less likely to be in the congregation or related to it. So listen out for what people say in your congregation. Sometimes congregations in a gathered kind of church resent those who are not weekly attenders. They only want the building for the photos, they might say, of a wedding couple. Or it's just folk religion wanting to sing carols. So such a congregation sometimes suspects the world out there. It thinks it hostile and suspicious. Uh, but is interested in it for the purposes of mission. I expect Really, most of our congregations are somewhere on a kind of continuum between the two, the bit of each. Um, but it's the second kind of church, the gathered one, which is becoming more common. Though it's itself giving away to the congregation that's entirely separate from the church building, the fresh expression, the network, meeting in a cafe or a leisure centre, or moving around connected through social media. Which is a kind of almost a kind of pure congregation where the relationships between the people are what really matter. Anyway, for all these sorts of reasons, attention is increasingly on the congregation and a gathered congregation at that. Going to church has become a conscious choice, swimming against the tide. Leslie Newbigan, I'm sure you've heard of, uh, always said that being a Christian was a cultural deviance. <coughs> She's 
<coughs> culturally deviant, um, it's more and more common to find that people who go to church will agree that they are swimming against the tide. They are distinct. They are different. And congregations are a distinct group in society. So how should we study them? How are we going to study congregations? Whose views should be listened to? Is it only believers, only insiders, who should have something to say about what a congregation is like? Or do outsiders have a valuable perspective as well? Particularly when the news is not so welcome, when it's not so good. Sheila Beeks, the unspellable theologian, said that church is one entity in two voices. One entity in two voices, human and divine. The church is both human and divine. And therefore theology and sociology both have something to say. And in the research that I've been doing, I've used both sociological and theological perspectives to examine the nature of local congregations. <coughs> Let's start with, um, with sociology. You might be uh, familiar with this distinction between quantitative and qualitative research. Quantitative research is all about counting, really, quantities. Um, you might count church attendance. Uh, you might count membership of the electoral roll. You might uh, count personal and social attributes like age, gender, ethnic identity, people leaving church, people attending church. That's sort of all that counting. That's one way of studying patterns and trends in congregations. It might be that you would use qualitative approaches. Spending time with the congregation, listening to views, attitudes, opinions, observing worship and action, seeing where the resources, the people and the power are situated, who makes decisions, who's related to whom, the influence of local history. As I've moved around the country in different parishes, I'm fascinated by the way that local history has influenced the culture of a place. At least I think it has. Nobody really knows. You can't really say that's definitely the case. And it's often the way. When you're counting with something, you can say two and two makes four. When you're doing qualitative research, you're thinking about trends, possibilities, ideas, not necessarily exactly provable, but some things there might be a fit. Is there something distinctive about Essex? Is there something that says, yes, the Lollards, the Lollards were so powerful here, pre-Reformation, who needs Luther? Could have got by without a European Reformation. I'm sure there's a, there's a thesis there. Um, Peasants' revolt. Cussed rebellion. Seems to be natural to Essex. The dissenters. I was walking through Billericay yesterday. There's a plaque on the wall to light the place where um, the Protestant dis dissenters were licensed to worship in 1672. They needed permission not to have to go to, to, go to the parish church. 1672. Very, very strong tradition in Essex of dissent against authority. Well, I don't know. It might just explain a few things. So, but that's not sort of, it's not, it's not like counting something. It's a qualitative understanding of, 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 of influences of what's going on. The social sciences can't evaluate a congregation, but can reveal unquestioned assumptions that shape attitudes and behavior. Not judging, but perhaps as an outsider, giving some information, asking questions, detecting trends that have happened. Like the trend I was saying, that people seem to be more ready to talk about congregations than they were maybe even 10 years ago. So that's what a social scientist could do. I have to own up to being much more interested in this qualitative research than I am in the quantitative. I'm more interested in, in trends, in ideas, and attitudes than, than in counting. Um, and, and so that's the area which I've been looking at. What sort of um, research might a sociologist, what sort of areas might a sociologist concentrate in? Might, for example, think of the church as an organisation and see how it organises itself. Plenty of organisations which the church can be compared with and similar questions asked. 
So imagine these questions for your congregation. The assets, financial, personnel. Who owns what? Who decides what? What's the role of the various officers, clergy, wardens, treasurer, and so on? So these are very Anglican questions. You can translate it, perhaps, if you're another, another church. How much is written down and how much is assumed? What are the unwritten rules? I was trying to think about the unwritten rules for Rorith. And I think one of the unwritten rules is that you're allowed to come into church and you can spread your coats out all over the chair. But this doesn't mean you reserve the seat. Now, to an outsider, it would look as though all the seats have been reserved. But actually, I don't think any of the people, really, would have a moment's hesitation to move stuff. So there's something which is deeply ingrained in people in Rorith, that you welcome people and make room for them. But that doesn't extend to not spreading the, their coats out if there's room to start off with. But they move it quickly if somebody wants to, but it could be quite off putting. Sort of, so you never quite understand that until you spend <coughs> some time watching people and seeing how they behave. I think that's an unwritten rule there. But unwritten rules are quite hard for insiders to perceive. It's quite often easier for an outsider to see what the unwritten rules are. What are the significant relationships between members in your congregation? In worship, who takes the lead? In governance, in core maintenance duties? Quite somebody who makes decisions about the roof could be quite different from people who make the decision about the liturgy. How's change managed? How's it viewed? What are the decision-making structures? How do you know when a decision has been made? All these are examples of organisational questions. And um, those who examine congregations are able to compare a congregation with other organisations. One example of that sort of study would be one by Margaret Harris. She investigated the circumstances in which lay people are paid for the work they do, when they're paid for the work they do, and when they volunteer, and what sort of assumptions are made about that. And because she was a bit of an outsider, her book reads like a description of somewhere a bit foreign so you realise it's familiar. She's very good at unearthing some of the roles and expectations that we have. So an outsider's view, very valuable to have. There's a lot of discussion about this insider-outsider perspective. Uh, here's an outsider's slide. That was the day uh, in May last year as uh, all the women who had been priests 20 years ago were invited to St Paul's Cathedral. Uh, a view of the women gathering beginning to line up and, and so on. And here, gloriously, is an insider's view of a woman's priest, me standing on the steps, looking down at everybody else. The same, same, similar, just one insider view and an outsider's view. Um, an anthropologist works on that boundary of being an insider and an outsider at the same time. It's called participant observation, being both a participant and an observer. And as I say, the methodology has been widely used in the study of local congregations. Um, called eth ethnography. Values van lengthy periods of intensive involvement in one community. And there's plenty of literature on how to be an ethnographer. How to prepare before you go out into the field. How to contact the right sort of people who are going to communicate something of what's going to happen. How to write it up afterwards. It's a method that's evolved in a century from an imperialistic desire to identify and describe native communities according to Western categories, that's the going off to exotic tribes in the South Sea Islands, to a belief in the value of allowing people to interpret their own understanding of their culture. So rather than thinking you can go somewhere else and describe what you know, the, the strange people are doing, saying, how can people themselves describe the life that they're leading, leading and the values that they have. There's an extensive literature on ethnography, an increasing literature on how to look at your own culture, the place where you are yourself, and interpret that. 
So there have been some fascinating studies of churches carried out by professional researchers who spent significant lengths of time in a single church listening and befriending the church members. The emphasis is always on discovering the local's own agenda. Not asking questions at once, as this determines the agenda, but through observation of what people do and say to each other and to God, to gain an understanding of how the worshippers are interpreting their membership of the church. This could have its frustrations. I first heard about this from an anthropologist who decided that what he wanted to do was spend some time in church listening to how people talked about their faith. And he spent three months in one church, went to every service he could, every meeting, midweek, Sundays, and nobody talked about their faith. <laughs> right. So then he wrote up his doctorate on why people don't talk about their faith. <laughs> Uh, then he went on, this is Martin Stringer, he went on to say, how do people interpret, why do people go to church if they're not going to talk about the faith? What does worship mean to them? Could you just have the greeting and then go straight to the coffee? Because people say we love meeting people and it's the fellowship and people, you know, people support us and, and it's a lovely warm church. Well, if that was the case, you could just go there and then you know, skip the worship bit and go straight to the coffee. But no, people seem to be coming for worship. He asked, he wanted to discover how people interpreted the meaning of their actions. How did the service itself generate meeting, meaning? Did people come to understand the Eucharist by doing it rather than by thinking it through? All these debates around children and communion tend to assume that for adults, rational understanding comes first. But in fact, he concluded it very rarely does. And he thought it was very difficult to, to distinguish between what should happen, according to the liturgists, and what people say is happening, what's, what, what's really, um, what can be observed, what they're doing. But he, he was, because he spent some time in four different churches of different denominations, he began to perceive some differences between churches, between denominations. No, he certainly wasn't saying that if he went into any Roman Catholic church or any Baptist church, he would find this. But of the four he visited, these were the differences he discerned. He went to a Baptist church, and he found that people talked about their own individual stories. But they resonated with biblical stories. People talked about being in a far country. People talked about a fire burning inside themselves. People picked up phrases from the Bible and related them to their own lives. The history of the church when it was founded, 1672, in the case of this one in Bilderich, that meant a lot to them as well. It was part of their own history. They assumed the history of the church and the biblical phrases were woven into their own individual stories. It was the Baptists. In the Roman Catholic Church, he found it was very important for people to go to Mass. But not so important that they went to any one particular church because they carried within themselves this belief that the Mass is always the same wherever and whenever it is celebrated. Even when the evidence was that it wasn't, as it were, and that they went on holiday, it was actually celebrated in a different way, uh, uh, that wasn't a matter for them to uh, uh, um, feel that they were able to express a preference. Because what they were required to really believe, what they wanted to believe, what the, was that the Mass was the same wherever and whenever it is celebrated. But what they needed to do was to be there. That was it. Be there. That's what established their identity, just to be there. An individual church, an independent church, I um, think a Pentecostal kind, independent Pentecostal, Martin went to. Every item of the worship focused back to the moment of conversion. At first he thought that each congregation's members' language was riddled with stock phrases and cliches. People talking being washed in the blood of the Lamb, standing under the cross. He thought, can't they say, think of anything original to say? But then he realised that these phrases were gradually, as people um, spent more time in the congregation, becoming personal. It starts out as a way of saying, I belong to this crowd, I'm using the same language. And then they became more and more meaningful to the person who was using them. 
So as people grew in faith and confidence, they personalised the message. But for the Anglicans, the most significant feature was that, that Stringer observed was that there were plenty of festivals. There was a real sense of time. The Anglicans do boredom like nobody else. <laughs> the Monday, morning prayer, evening prayer, in ordinary time. Uh, but also the highs and the lows. And there was a something of pacing through life for an Anglican. So being an anthropologist enabled him to make some comparisons and do some observations like that. My own research has been into the relationships between ordained and lay leaders in local churches. I'm investigating how the period immediately before the arrival of the new minister and the period of induction between arrival and a few months after licensing can be best used to prove the quality of the relationship between minister and congregation. I facilitated conversations between the lay leadership of the local church and the newly appointed priest about models of ministerial <coughs> leadership. I've been guiding the conversations, but they've not been interviews. I've just sort of thrown in some topics for discussion. I've wanted to encourage discussion of hopes and fears for the future and to see what models of leadership were held by those present. I've done it as an insider, as I said, it's a professional doctorate, a form of doctoral research common in the medical and educational world, in which the researcher practitioner examines his or her own practice in the light of theory. And one theory I found very interesting is systems theory. Systems theory is more interested in the connections between units or components than the individual units themselves. Some of you would be familiar with this, whether through the medical world or, or computing or or nuclear physics, or, or something like that. A growing interest, not in individual components, but in connections, relationships between components. The GP, uh, I know, always has a mobile hanging in her room. And when a parent brings a sick child, she said, it's like that bit of the mobile moving, that sick child, you know what happens? The rest of the mobile moves. She said, how's the rest of your family? Because the family is a system. What affects one? affects everybody. A family systems therapist would always ask questions about what's going on in the immediate relations of which the apparently sick or disturbed person is a part. And applying that to congregations, rather than designating somebody as the leader um, or the troublemaker, you say, what set of relationships have created that behaviour? Family systems therapists are used to the idea that one person may exhibit the symptoms of dis-ease experienced by many. Now I've heard lots of people, as I've talked to people, describe their church as a family, suggesting it's a place of close emotional relationships. Those who spoke of their congregation seemed well aware that families had changed from the nuclear structure of two married parents and children. Um, that's a very recent problem, not, not biblical pattern at all. Um, they were much more likely to think of the congregation as like an extended family. And with step parents, step children, honorary aunts and uncles and, and so on. And a congregation can share some of the relationship with space and time that an extended family does. Absent family members are deemed to be present in a communal emotional life. And past family members can have a great influence on present ones. Um, as we know. Sometimes the, the, there's, a, there's a kind of real presence of the people who are not actually in the room. Some of the ways then that sociology has informed our understanding of congregations. Um, social scientists look at congregations as organisations, as small exotic tribes, and as a family. So to theology. And family language is actually a very good example of theology and social sciences providing complementary lenses through which to view a congregation. <coughs> Sociology is obviously very interested in humans in community. And the study of family has a rich tradition in both sociology and theology. But it should be noted, when I talk about theology, it's here including not only primary texts and written works of theology, but also thoughts, words, actions, of members of the Christian congregation. 
And two books that have been very influential in person, Laurie Green's book, Let's Do Theology. Uh, the idea that everybody in the congregation will, will be able to contribute to discussion of God and his ways in the world because of their experience, because of their understanding, because of their prayer gleaned over faithful years. Uh, an orderly theology uh, from Jeff Astley, um, who said that people have an understanding of God, even those who haven't had academic theological training. So it's ordinary theology. But what's the view from the pew? The relationship between these various voices of theology is well expressed by Cameron, Bat and Deuce, who describe the four voices of theology. The normative voice is the theological canon, uh, that's the Bible. Uh, the formal theological voices, those who have studied and written about the, the, the Bible and, and the creeds. Uh, the espoused theology about what the group says they believe, what a congregation says it believes, and the operant theology being what it actually does. Sometimes there's not always a complete uh, consonance between what you say you believe and what you actually do as you live out in theological practice. I mean, let's look at some of that formal theology. <coughs> Relations between church members have also received attention recently because of ecclesiologists that link the nature of the church to the nature of the Trinitarian <coughs> God. Attention to the life of the Trinity has proved to be the most fruitful area of theology, which the nature of the congregation has been derived. This is the Cappadocian Fathers, Basil, Gregory, <coughs> and Gregory. They wanted to understand the Trinity in terms of the way in which the persons of the Godhead relate to each other. Not as three separate persons, but concentrating on the, on the interaction between them. The chief consequence of asserting God is three persons in relation is to say God is essentially relational. Therefore, a relational content is built into the notion of being. The world is not structured around logic, for example, the Platonists and Neoplatonists held, but relationship. And the persons of the Godhead cannot be known except in the varying ways that they interact with each other. So the assertion of the Cappadocian Fathers that the relationship that one has with God leads to a relationship with other people also has epistemological consequences. I know they work together. They understood things in relationship with each other. They weren't individuals banging away at Trinitarian theology on their own. They are an example of relational epistemology. There's no knowledge, they asserted, the, the being of God, of ourselves or of each other as isolated individuals acquired from objective observation. We only come to know God through participating in the life of God, through prayer, service, a membership of Christian fellowship. So this perception that relationships within the Trinity are indicative of ideal relationships in the church has been influential in recent thinking about the development of local congregations. It's here that what we believe about God is experienced, and it's here that we join in the life of God, which is relational. Much contemporary focus on congregations has grown from Newbigin's perception of the church as the sign, instrument, and foretaste of God's redeeming grace for the whole life of society. That arose from his understanding that Western civilization was infertile soil for the, for the church and for faith. And you need to have bodies of Christian believers to make it believable in any sense. The Bible obviously talks about the church as a family right through the Bible is the story of the family, beginning with Abraham. A family which grows, becomes a large family, so that it becomes an ethnic group and has to be kicked out of Egypt. But a family. Family relationships are continually referred to in the Old Testament. But what is significant with Jesus' arrival is that he says the family doesn't just include the Jewish nation. A new family can be created out of these very stones, actually, says Jesus. Jesus says to each person, imitate your Father in heaven. Speak to God as your Father, not just the Jewish people's Father. 
And when he prays, uh, in, recorded in John chapter 17, that he and the Father may be one with his followers, he's saying, you are part of this life. You are part of this life, this closeness, this relationship within the Trinitarian God. <coughs> Paul, who was a Pharisee and a good Jew, he wrestled with this identity of the new Christian community, which contains Gentiles as well as Jews. So he writes of a new family. And you must care for those in the family of faith. He talks about the creation of a new body of people who can relate to each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. In the new Christian family, the fatherhood of God creates equality between all those who are the children of God. There's no distinct roles assigned to individuals or groups. No one is given a particular title as all our children of God. The language of baptism is also very influential. It's now common for baptisms to take place in the main Sunday worship, and the Church of England website explains that this is so your church can be seen to be joining the family of the church. I want to ask you a question, those of you who remember services from the past, okay? Um, in the ASB, the words, the alternative service book, the words to children old enough to understand were, when you are baptised, you become a member of a new family. God takes you for his own child and all Christian people will be your brothers and sisters. If you could point me to a comparable passage in common worship, I'd be grateful because I can't find it. It seems to me that in common worship, some of the language of family has been toned down. The words of welcome, um, in the past were, we welcome you into the Lord's family, we are children of the same Heavenly Father. That has become, we welcome you into the fellowship of faith. Some of the language of family has been sidelined. I'm interested. And one fascinating feature of my research was that while in the main lay people wanted to call their church a family, the majority of clergy resisted this and indeed, on two occasions, rebuked their new colleagues for even mentioning it. Why should this be? I've got some ideas, I'll come back to that. I want to look at the question of whether sociology and theology can work together. Uh, this is the book that Edward lent me. John Milbank, I, I did ask him for it, it wasn't just to come out of the blue. Um, John Milbank, um, uh, Theology and sociology, Social Theory, I can't um, claim to have read dip into it, it's a dipping into book. Um, John Milbank said that sociology is a secular policing of the supply and has become such a dominant discourse that we are not allowed to mention religion as a serious um, component of, of the research. Sociology is pushing the So therefore we mustn't let it take over. He criticises things like liberation theology for letting Marxism set the agenda. We mustn't let anything set the agenda except theology. Okay. Milbach will say that we mustn't let any other ology, any other theory, any other uh, source of truth set the agenda for our thinking other than theology. I found it helpful to remember that I'm just studying for a professional doctorate and so I'm looking at myself. And my own experience has been that I've examined my place in church life and the involvement with those who I've been worshipping, and I realise that I am interpreting people naturally, both stemming from my understanding of Christian faith and the Bible and the liturgy, but also stemming from some of the wisdom that sociologists and other social scientists have given. So this triangle um, uh, just been my attempt to express how I've understood the relationship between sociology and theology, and I'm included in the triangle because it's partly the way that they have impacted on me, influenced me, This has enabled me to see that if I'm participating in this research, not as an objective observer, but as part of what I am observing, I can't exclude the insights from either theology or sociology. What's the relationship between my own self and the social sciences, for example? We both, as it were, both have an understanding of the self as communal. We both 
uh, understanding that the researcher is part of what's researched, part of the situation researched. And this aids reflexivity as the experience of qualitative researchers acts as a corrective to kind of unreflective religiosity. It's so easy to be pious. It's so easy to be It's so good to have outside voices and say, don't go down that road. It's my contention that insights from both theological and sociological disciplines can be held together in the reality of a lived experience of the researcher in relationship with members of local churches. In fact, it would hard to be hard to exclude them. It would sound to me like to say there are some ways that God cannot reveal God's self to us if we would say we're not going to listen to what sociology is going to say. We might want to be primarily theological, but to say we need a conversation. We're open to insight from wherever it comes. <coughs> because we are participating in this. We're not standing back adjudicating between different sources of information. We're each of us participating in the life that we're trying to understand. Social scientists now expect to acknowledge their own assumptions. So Christians can say what their assumptions are. This is my assumption. There is a God. But also I know that I, I don't perceive things correctly. The church has not got it right the whole time. We see through a glass darkly, very darkly sometimes. We need all the light we can see. So the epistemology has guided my own research has confirmed its relationship and not isolation that reveals insight and knowledge. This is supported both by Trinitarian theology <coughs> and systemic thinking about the church. It provides a strong indication of the benefit of dialogue, conversation between theological and sociological perspectives. The examination of the local congregation as a family can proceed on the basis of the shared understanding of our <coughs> ontology. Both theology and sociology will express humility about their viewpoints. The sociologist is always going to be unsure that reality is really real. And the theologian is always going to be aware of their own human weaknesses. Just, I said, I said, why, 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 why is the version? This is Justin trying to get into the church. <laughs> but that was actually, a, I think, a church in the newspaper about the, the debate about women bishops, and Justin said, we cannot just ignore people when they are our family. Um, is it? I think some there is a hesitation sometimes on the part of those who care about mission to hear the congregation described as a family because it sounds a bit uh, exclusive. Some people feel that. Not sure it's intended that way. <coughs> some people resist it because it feels a bit patriarchal. As so though it was an old style family that was being referred to. Again, I'm not sure that's that's the case in terms of the people I've talked to. Uh, some people resist it because it feels too intimate uh, uh, and perhaps too redolent of poor experiences of themselves in their own families. Um, uh, and, and being aware of their own family and uh, uh, of the baggage that they carry around would rather move to a different kind of model for a combination. Um, but uh, of the people I talked to, of the lay people, wanted to hold on to the idea of the congregation as a family because it was the only way that they could express the strength of um, emotional relationship that they felt, which sometimes led to conflict, but the sort of conflict you have in families when things really matter. Um, uh, and, and, it, and, it, and it expressed the fact that they felt that they were sharing a future with these people. It wasn't just you know, social group, it was a community that mattered. Um, and thinking about the congregation as a whole, <coughs> uh, it, it facilitates dialogue between theology and sociology. It enables us to have a conversation with those people who are not looking for uh, revelation from God as the first source of knowledge about a congregation. It enables us to communicate with other people who are interested in studying congregations. And so that together we, we each of us learn more about this strange, exotic tribe that's our church family. Thank you very much. I rather like the
the description of a strange exotic family. So, <laughs> although whether we should be comfortable with that is another matter. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to know whether we might have a bit of time for um, yeah. some questions and, yeah, and yeah. Um, some, some more dialogue. Um, I mean, has anyone got something they'd like to pick up on straight away? <coughs> Um, or, or would it help to do that little thing of perhaps just talking to your neighbour for one minute just to kind of bring to life something that might be just rattling around your mind and there's some fascinating things around some of those descriptions of different kinds of churches the slightly traditional building in its parish and then the gathered congregation and then that very striking image of the purely relational church in, in the cafe um, very interesting I love the things about Martin Stringer. He, he waited three months to hear someone talk about their faith and, and, and didn't hear anyone <laughs> talk about their faith. But there are other things forming that congregation. And also the thing that fascinated me around what you said about the distinctiveness of the Anglican church, the festivals and the ordinary time. Mm -hmm. Just talk to your neighbour for, for, for one minute um, and just allow some of that to wrap around and then we'll, we'll see where conversation takes us. Great. Thank you for saying <coughs> I'm going to call you back now. I was about to say something like, Dear family. Have you noticed how Bishop Stephen addresses people? No. I don't think it's Stephen, it has been, let's have a few noticed, remarked to me that previous bishops have never started any address by saying sisters and brothers. But Stephen does. Watch out. Well, that was so obviously it hasn't impacted on you because, but, but several people mentioned that to me. And talked about how in the past the uh, the the uh, parish share was called the family purse. Uh, and you know, again, that's changed. So, does so anyone want to start the ball rolling with a question or a comment? Well, the bishops won up. The bishops won up on the apostle Paul. He only called them brothers. Well, the NRS be brothers and sisters, which of course all the great things. Absolutely. Absolutely. We, we talked about family a lot. I like yeah. it as a, a half bearer, as it were, to find the church. I think it's non scriptural, completely against the teaching of Jesus, and, and is an inaccurate description. I mean, I mean hope, holy then, because I think it, 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 on the level of function, as a metaphor, I think it's hopeless. And that doesn't look like it's a family at all. I, 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 I think they're different things. I, I, even at the metaphorical level, I find it very difficult uh, to, to oppose it. So you react against the word very strongly. Oh, they did come with a lovely one, though. A lovely different version. Village. The village. The village. The village. The church's village. I came to that rather better. Yeah. I can even come with the word household, which is A, yes. scriptural, and B, yeah. more, yeah. more yeah. diverse. Yeah. And the household of God thing, yeah. which of course, would be claimed to keep a Benedictine monk. Yeah. 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 I am not family. Uh, I, sorry, I, I, I can't quite analyse what it is about family. It is actually, it's very interesting that the reaction is always emotional. Yeah, 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 no, I see. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think it's very, I've given all the biblical verses I'm just sending through to you. But, uh, but, it, but the reaction always, is always a good conversation. Jesus actually said, Who are my mother and my brothers and my sisters? These. Those who obey my words, yes. And therefore, he, he, he denies the notion of human family. It's his creative yeah, new family. He creates a huge, bigger family. Yes, it's a new family that's created. So, yeah. But I, I, I like the language of household yeah. of God as well. And I, I mean, I've wondered about that because a household is a, is a sort of territorial thing, actually. You know, it's, it feels more like a, um, a space, a place, rather than a network of relationships. Interesting. And the rest of the, I mean, the two interrelate. Yeah. But yeah. They, are, they are distinctly different yeah. starting points. The other interesting thing I noticed between the difference between the lay and ordained um, thing was that lay people tended to tell me what happened, what they did, what they thought. Clergy tended to determine what they thought ought to happen. <laughs> people ought to be using this language of household, they are using the language of family. So it's an is ought kind of thing. Yeah. So you've got lots of Yeah, yeah. Um, yes. Um, well, just to confirm that observation, but certainly in the church where I am, which is small and rural, if you ask particularly the newer members of the congregation what they get out of going to church, it's they use family they will say it's a family. And they're people with families of their own, not necessarily in the area. But that's why they're there, and that's what it feels like. It's interesting. This, this Christmas card comes from somebody who had their child baptised this year in Warren, and has been to church about six times during the year. Mm -hmm. but, so I was quite surprised when I opened up the Christmas card. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>
Is it possible to track it track against signs? Because I, I mean, I've, I've lost eight, seven, eight, no, the last ten years I've been being larger. Mm -hmm. And the, and the notion of family has not been, not been what I've been. I mean, Meadow has listened, not listened. No, no. Uh, so he's only at the moment, I've been having 200, no, last one, 400, and this, you know, it's having more size than the fields. But that's all the reason. Yes, yes. And family is not, a, not an obvious metaphor no, for no. that size of children. The, 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 uh, one close person I talked to who will have experience with our shows <coughs> said that they intentionally talked about the family. Right. I think they do a great matter. And they intentionally structured things which enable people to relate to people uh, as family. <coughs> I think very badly they, they talk about family there. But it, it might be that there's a boy, no, uh, a Barking Abbey, mm -hmm. Bishop Trevor will talk about the family uh, as, as a non negotiable because of God being our Heavenly Father. That's because it's a multi ethnic congregation and it's a, you know. Well, I, I wonder if it's sometimes that it's a sort of a motive. Um, thing uh, in the same way as a lot of people don't find it easy to relate to God as a father initially, and, and some of them need a lot of prayer before they can do that because of their experiences of an earthly father. Also, with family, if they've had bad experiences with families, it's quite difficult to actually see all your brothers and sisters in, in Christ as part of a family. It can go either way, actually, I've talked to. Um, it can go either way. Some people will say, The church is the family I never had. God is the father I never had. So, so I, I, yes, people will say they must be worried about using that sort of language, but actually sometimes it is the healing moment in which people are. Because adoption is such a key <coughs> concept. Is there a dimension of that where it's replacing the extended family that used to be two or three doors down from us in, in, in the past? Yeah. Is, is that dimension going on as well with, with people who come and say, well, Essentially, they're saying, I'm reclaiming the extended family that I no longer have because my auntie doesn't live down the road, etc., etc., etc. So, only the, the priest I, I talked to, who had been priest in Europe with an expatriate congregation, had a very, very clear sense that, that it was a substitute family. And that's what people were saying. A multi generational, so that people were choosing to come to church and to link up with people so that their children could experience it, what it was like for somebody who had their grey hair. Uh, then an honorary grandparents that's in because they're you know their natural families so that was a very very clearly artificially created family as it were but with very good biblical and theological mm. we've got at least one more hand kind of hands so yes i was um, just thinking that if you think of a family as a place where you get support and i know there aren't some good families but generally speaking Maybe the word support has something to say. Uh, as a parish priest, I once remember running a, a parish day uh, in which we asked people why they came to church. And a surprising number of people said because of the support we get. I mean, I, I think they felt more fitting in the church. Their own active faith would start to decline. And they felt that uh, actually participating in the worship is that people who have bad experiences of the family, backgrounds kind of thing, actually retain an understanding of what would be good. And really people are very, very damaged when they have no idea of what would be better, which happens. But, but even folk, so folk know what they're looking for. Uh, and, uh, and, and what they're looking for is a community of people with whom they can feel at ease. And, and you might, uh, uh, yeah, family has become the better for them. And from people who can get support. Yes, yeah, exactly, that's it. Yeah. Just a, a comment on the conversation happening earlier. Uh, I, I'm not a, by no means a sociologist, but my understanding is that the way one feels one belongs to a group is very much determined by the size of that group. So the one, the, the way I may feel part of a, a group of a thousand, I can, I can feel I belong, but that meaning is different to, um, I suppose, taking it to the other extreme, if I happen to have a group of 12 amongst me, which you know, Jesus created quite a good pattern on that, um, and that relationship is a very different one. And I, I don't mean to be critical or rude, but I wonder whether it's a bit simplistic to, to use family 
uh, as a means of looking at all of those types of reactions. And indeed, um, my question really is, is um, we focus on, on the notion of conjugation, but that is, is only one type of group that would exist within a parish or within a church community. Uh, there would be house groups or, or uh, prayer groups or whatever. Uh, would, would you, do you think the relationship is the same there, or are they, do they have a different sort of... Um, it's, it's a bit like Nicholas's question about size. Mm. But you're quite right. And, and, and a lot of large churches will structure like house groups or, or smaller groups for people to relate to into, into smaller units for, for that very... So that some people can have more intimate relationships and can cope with a small number of people because you don't relate on exactly the same way as I understand that. Um, I think what's, uh, uh, when I say congregation as a, as, a, as a topic for study, you're quite right, there's lots of other things happening. There's the Boyd Lewis Guild and there's the uh, But the interesting thing, both the theologians and sociologists, is why are people coming and gathering for worship? It's such a waste of time. You know, it's, it's, as I say, when it goes straight to the coffee, if it's support you, what's actually happening with this, this small exotic tribe who are worshipping? Sociologists are interested because it is kind of countercultural. Uh, Christians are, are interested because it might be that that's the only living parable of the gospel. And, and so, and for all the reasons I said, that, that it's actually worshipping congregations that I was particularly thinking about. And, and they will be family in different ways, but, but some people can be part of a large extended family, of which they, there are people who turn up at Rora's sometimes. We don't know how they're related to the church warden, but we know, she knows they are. <laughs> you know, but, um, you know, it, that sometimes, in some places, uh, um, even blood relationships get very, and, and in, 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 in the, on places where there's stepchildren and several marriages, you know, relationships get very, very confused. Mm -hmm. And it's that kind of family, I'm talking about, not the kind of mom, dad, and two kids. I think that family can have such a level of ownership more than anything else that it that can be more exclusive. Than anything else. I personally, even though I go to church a lot, I belong to church, as it were, I think church is one of the most <coughs> exclusive bodies of people that I know and I'm ever likely to know. Because of all its, you've got to be this, you've got to do it this way, you can't receive communion unless. Mm -hmm. um, and at the moment, you say that somebody cannot come up to communion, and people do, and they don't understand what they're doing, mm. and, and I think that's fine, mm. because however, how are they going to receive grace? If we say this is grace, some people say it's Jesus, some people say we do this in memory of, no matter what, it's a grace. And if we're excluding people from receiving this grace in the first place, just because they don't understand, then surely, you know, Jesus would have done that. I think we're, if we are a family, and I don't like to see us as a family, personally. Um, I think we're exclusive. But uh, again, I say, what I was saying, uh, this, is, this is how people were describing their churches. I wasn't trying to say, I mean, I, I think no, 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 I'm, I'm interested in the contrast, yes, I'm interested in the contrast, uh, I think, between what uh, Jeff Astley would describe as ordinary theology, he was saying, our church is a family, and the kind of academic theology of, uh, uh, of those who have been trained in the academic mm -hmm. sense, are saying, you shouldn't say that. So it's actually, the, the, I'm quite interested in the contrast, but I'm, I'm, uh, so I'm, I'm, but I am saying a lot of congregation members and ladies are saying our oh, church is a family. And well, why is that? And how does that relate to so what sociologists say about family? Two more hands, we'll, we'll take this one first and then this. If I'm quite troubled about the history of worship, the relationship of the congregation isn't only with each other or with the priest leaders of the church, but actually with God. And the point I think that sociology can't really come to terms with is the fact that uh, a belief in God is essentially irrational, because God is a supernatural being. And therefore, uh, that can't be explained in mm -hmm. sociological terms. Mm -hmm. And the whole issue about being a family is in a sense a side issue. 
at the end of the day, because the worship itself is the way, surely, in which uh, we as Christians um, come before God ourselves yes. uh, at that particular time. Now, of course, not everybody that steps into a church understands the worship and, you know, uh, that sort of thing, but this is really surely described properly mm -hmm. in the journey that the people have in faith, that they need to hear the gospel about 30 times before they come to believe um, what is in it. And then, of course, there's, you know, confirmation, study, reading the Bible, and all those things that follow from that. So, um, whilst I think, thank you very much for your lecture, Ultimately, I still feel that uh, it's a matter of faith, really, uh, and people seeking that faith uh, is why they come to church and why worship occurs, occurs in that way. Mm -hmm. And the other questions about support and family are supplementary, mm -hmm. ultimately. Yes, I think what a sociologist could do is, is ask the kind of questions that are, are like, um, why are these people doing something which appears to me to be rational? Which is a very good question. And, and will arrive at an insight which will be different from the person who finds the practice completely normal. So it is the insider outsider perspectives which I think are both valuable. You know, the, the story of, of um, somebody arriving, opening the door of a small room which there's 20 people inside and there's clouds of smoke, days when people smoked. And the person who's just arrived says it's cloudy in here, and everybody in the room says, "How do you know you've only just arrived?" <laughs> um, you know, from, from the point of being inside, there are some things which we become blinkered about, mm. and, and sometimes it's good to have an outsider. But it would not make sense. Correlation doesn't make sense. Actually, it would be interesting. Do some correlations make sense without the worship? Mm. Because obviously, from your point of view, it would be, it would be useless. But one suspects sometimes. Um, that the congregation could just skip the worship and go straight to the coffee. It exists now. It does exist now. Yes. Oh, yes, 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 exactly. Yes, there are now non religious church services in Chicago. Right? But they do still have a lot of singing and stuff still. <laughs> Chris. Yep, um, I'm just, um, just taking up the point from the lady at the front. Um, and I'm one of the, or when a parish priest, I was uh, guilty of uh, uh, trying to censor the word family. For similar reasons, really, that it seemed to be exclusive. Yes. And also, inescapably hierarchical, even when you get the equivalent of the New Testament, which is household. That is a highly patriarchal, um, hierarchical set up. Um, and the point about the family is, uh, as the word is normally used, um, okay, you talk about an extended family, and you can have third cousins or fifth cousins twice removed, or whatever it may be. But in fact, the way the word family is used now has some pretty clear boundaries around it. It doesn't cross generations like the communion of saints does. Um, and Jesus' deconstruction of the kinship family, his, his attack on it basically, um, which Nicholas was quoting earlier on, um, I, I mean, it's deeply ironic. It's, it's the, what he's creating is, is a movement, not a family, not a household, um, but, but a movement which is going to, to change things and to be, and to be ready for, for a new world. And to narrow that to the notion of family, Quite apart from all the, um, you know, dangers of exclusivism, um, seems to me to be a, a sort of narrowing down of the focus of the gospel as a whole. Now that's a highly theological uh, mm -hmm. a, and a priestly rather than a lay perspective. But, so but I think that was that was really yeah. why I'm this. I'm going to pretend um, I'm a sociologist for a second and just sort of wonder aloud whether, say, in South Africa, back in the apartheid days, and parts of the church were campaigning strongly against apartheid. Would those congregations have used the family idea, or would they have been talking more in terms of a campaigning movement? Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't know. Um, no. I found the one priest, I hope you don't mind me quoting him, who was so strongly in favour of family language, Bishop Trevor. Mm -hmm. He met Bishop Trevor, you know, talk about, you haven't met him yet, trying to go and hear him speak. Take a bottle of red wine with him. <laughs> <laughs> Former Bishop of uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, and Botswana. Was, well, no, sorry, Botswana. Mm. Botswana. So, former Bishop of Botswana. Now, um, uh, Rector of uh, Barking Abbey, St. Margaret's Barking. Um, multi ethnic congregation, uh, uh, and uh, Bishop Trevor kind of embodies the Anglican communion uh, as he walks around. Um, and, and 
he would say it's a non-negotiable. God mm. is our Heavenly Father. We are one family. Mm. Mm. We are one family because language, nationality, social status, doesn't matter. Mm. It's a flat family. Completely unhierarchical. We're all the same. We're all children of God. So I think in that sense, he, if, 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 I'm sure if Bishop Trevor had been in South Africa, he would be talking about the oneness of humanity because we're all children of the same Heavenly mm -hmm. Father. But is, is he relating that to the to the specific congregation or to the to the Church Catholic, uh, the you know, world something worldwide? Well, we were talking what, about what? the congregation at the time, so I, I didn't get right. to ask him. Okay. Yeah. You know, Fatherhood of God and Brotherhood of yeah. kind of issue. Can I just change tack? Yes, I very much appreciated your talk this evening. It's a couple of areas that fascinate me. Um, but you talked quite a bit about what you're actually doing and how you try to do it. Yeah. Are you beginning to be able to draw any conclusions out from your own particular area of work in this, or are you so very much on the way with that? Well, um, I, I think that I'm going to, to propose that a good way of um, a newly appointed priest in the parish to talk with their lay leaders, wardens, whatever, about models of leadership is to discuss the idea of family. Because uh, and just uh, because it's a, it's because it's a subject which, which engages people, um, because it throws up all sorts of under, you know assumptions and um, uh, expectations about how uh, ordained leadership uh, should operate and how lay leadership relates to that, and uh, and what this unit is this, this congregation this system you know, that, that both of lay and ordained leaders are, are trying to lead. Um, uh, it should needs to be a facilitated conversation because it, it facilitates in the sense of this sort of third party, just kind of guiding things and stopping people having too many red herrings and, uh, uh, and achieving something at the end. But I think it, it, it's, it's a very good conversation topic to get people to think about what is our church. People find it very difficult to say um, we want uh, a leader to be collaborative or facilitative or kind of more, you know, abstract things like that. Mm -hmm. It's easier to talk in models and metaphors. Mm -hmm. People might, some other people might say, well, I'd rather have use a model of, you know, a midwife, you know, as a, as a model of leadership, you know, neighbours, you know, so somebody might be a team coach, you know, to coach this team of the children. Uh, but they will use models more easily mm -hmm. than abstract language. Mm -hmm. And since family it. language is biblical and the church, and it's there around and in the ether, and you can say how it's different and how it's similar. Yeah, mm. and I think that it's, it's a good way of unearthing a lot of the hopes and fears. Brian, mm. mm. do you think it would be possible for you to come back when you finish this project? <laughs> 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 um, yes, I, I, I'm sure it would be. Yeah, um, but it won't be because it's a positive project. It won't be conclusive in the sense of the answer. No, you know, it no, means no. trying out. And, and, and if you want to try it out, you know, you can try it out. See what, what happens in your place when you start. So in a very practical way, supposing I've just been appointed to a, a new job as a parish priest. And bef so when I, before I move, I go and talk with, with the lay leaders about using metaphor, maybe a family metaphor, and just sort of see what a conversation is, or, or after I've moved house, but before I've been licensed, or after I've yes. been licensed? Or well, one of the things times. that I was trying to do was meet with some of the lay leaders before the licensing, um, in that period when somebody's already arrived in the parish, but before the licensing. But for the, the, for the lay leaders, the church wardens, parish reps, leader, it was such a busy time. I mean, people were so gracious to me, but it really was pushing, uh, 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 yeah. So um, I, I don't advise that to happen. I think people just need to have the licensing service and then they can put a bit of a limitation. But I realise that for many lay people, um, the, the licensing service is kind of presented as the end of a really tough period, but you can relax a bit now because the priests are around. Um, but actually, it's a time of real tension because they're wondering, what's this new person going to be like? Will I be allowed to carry on preaching? Will they, will they let me do the things that, you know, so it's actually quite, a, you know, there's a um, the first first few months, and not a honeymoon period, they're kind of boxing around each other. Um, uh, and it's in that period that I think it's worth um, having a conversation, as I say, perhaps facilitating, to learn a bit about the history, to get the lay people to tell the priest how it was in the past 
quite a few places were quite reluctant, not wanting to sort of set the agenda. But what sort of language was used in the past? Did your predecessor, um, or no, in one priest, in our joint meeting, we had a joint meeting, um, learned that his predecessor told everybody to use, to call each other brothers and sisters. Mm. He was very unhappy with that. Mm. Um, but that was the language which was used. Um, and, but it was very useful for him to know that. Uh, you know, he would pick it up, you know, gradually, just to know what what had been done in the past, a bit of a bit of background, uh, a bit of the expectations, um, and then to say, uh, to suggest family as a model. I'd say if 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 you've described your church as a family, how do you see your new priest? Is he your father? Your elder brother? Your uncle? You know, where would he fit in? Um, uh, and then see what the reactions are. No, 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 we don't do that at all. We would like to. What we really want is a um, is a team coach. You know, somebody who can prod us along a bit. You know, um, or or what? And then perhaps somebody will say, No, what you want is a captain of the ship. And the priest will say, I'm certainly not going to be the captain on the, you know, the bridge deck. You know. So there's a discussion that goes on about models. Um, and I I found that that was a conversation which enabled people to express some of their the, the assumptions, I think it's expectations that are real killers in relationship. It's not always the things which are said, it's the things which are not said. Mm -hmm. Those of you who've done marriage preparation know that if you're with an engaged couple, you want them to talk about, was it money, sex and children, mm -hmm. basically. And it doesn't really matter what they decide about those things. Um, you know, they can have 12 children in separate bank accounts and everything like that. But they've got to agree, they've got to have talked about it. Well, it's the same in, a, in that relationship between the newly arrived priest and the, and the lay leaders. They don't need to agree, but they need to have understood where each other are and to have come to some sort of working arrangement. Um, and I think that understanding of what they're expecting in terms of leadership models is a very good conversation to have in the first few months after licensing. And because it's a system, remember the mobile that hangs, because it's a system in the congregation, um, whatever one person does is going to affect everybody else. Um, I think that was something which I realised. We often treat congregations as collections of individuals. And we say, you know, that's the talkative one, that's the awkward one, that's the quiet one, actually. But people are often feel, um, more often filling roles in relationship to other people. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a need for a talkative one, a quiet one, an awkward one. Um, or people get forced into sticking with a role that they're not particularly happy with. Mm -hmm. We're affected by the people that, that we're in. The school I went to, we had a, a motto, which was, that which touches one touches all. Mm -hmm. A bit like John Dunn, their man is an island. Mm -hmm. That sort of sense, that we're not actually um, identifiable atoms, you know, mm -hmm. sitting in little boxes, etc. Right. But, you know, we are interacting with each other the whole time. We're bouncing across each other. Yes. I'm rather latching on to this idea of um, having this conversation with a new incumbent because I'm in an interregnum at the moment. And um, I'm just thinking that um, I think it's a pretty good conversation to have, but to a certain extent, I think everyone has in them the way that they manage other people. It's a bit like because I'm an ex teacher, some teachers get to a new academic year and they either want to know the history of the, all the new people in their class or they want to start afresh. They have their own way of approaching things. So I'm thinking that perhaps this conversation is quite good to have before we all appoint someone. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, because we have that time, I've been told, when we show them around and then we have the interviews, you know. And so I think that ought to be touched on a bit earlier when you're actually stuck with the person. Because it, how everyone interrelates is so important. I, one of the questions I asked was what would be different for? Um, and there was a very interesting balance between um, the way people express what they're looking for. Somebody who fits our culture, does things our way, um, has the same sort of values as us. Um, but that didn't make something who's going to keep us as we are. It meant somebody who would change in the way that we want to change. Somebody who will take us, perhaps help us, perhaps we don't feel we can get there on ourselves. But somebody who will continue our history rather than make a radical break. 
And people, one, one parish expressed this in, in a model. They said, it's like the train's been going with our you know, the predecessor, and he was wonderfully kind and generous and a pastor, and he encouraged us all. And we all felt devastated when he left, and it's been a real bereavement. And the, the train has kind of, the train of the congregation has kind of slowed down, and he got off. We all felt, we kept going, we kept things, you know, Sunday services kept going, we kept the fellowship going, and, and we, we, we haven't lost many people, and, and some people have joined, and the train's been, and now this new guy has kind of got on, and we're scared stiff of him, because he's, he's got ideas, and he's got, you know, um, but actually we think we can cope with him, because of the confidence that we got from his predecessor, and the train's going to go, oh, yeah. so it's this idea of the train moving, slowing down, one person got off, one person got on, and they're off again. That was lovely. Really nice trust. It was continuous. It was, a, it was a narrative. It was a history that somebody was joining rather than starting out with a clean slate. And, and you're quite right, that narrative is very important for people to see that continuity. People like to believe that their predecessor was complete rubbish and that they are going to transform the place. <laughs> but actually, you're always joining a history of what's going on. The whole subject of family history is, has become, I don't know if this links at all, but that's in, it, in its own way has become much higher profile, hasn't it? And many more people who have seen me in family history as well. I don't mind a complete red herring, but it just came into my head. <laughs> are, are there any more comments or questions that people want to make? Uh, I mean, I, I'm, um, I'm just remembering that when Jesus taught, he, he used the parables. But they were they seem to be all about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. And I'm wondering how the language about the kingdom of heaven and God's kingdom fits with family and all of that as well. I mean is that to the twain meet or, I don't or know. how, I don't know. how, how might that, that connection be made? That. As I said, I've been listening to what people say. Yeah, yeah. And they haven't said the uh, formation is a taste of the kingdom. No. Um, so they just, you know, so in terms of, kind of hearing what people say, that's not what people say. Um, but I think it's another model. Kingdom is another corporate. It's a community. It's not an individual. It's not individual salvation. The body of Christ, systemic model. So, uh, 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 so just in terms of thinking the value of models, how each of these models are communities, systemic. Uh, not individual, you know, not, not, not people being idols. Mm. That's the only way everything I can think yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Mm. Yeah. I realise I'm going to have to reflect on the fact that Bishop Stephen supposedly starts everything saying, yes, this is nice. Oh, yeah. then, how do I say, I, when I'm doing something a bit like that, I tend to use the idea of friends, dear friends, <coughs> which of course is actually the summer, isn't there? I ought to know my Bible better, but there is a place where Jesus says, you can, I'm not going to call you anything else yet except friends. It's somewhere in John's Gospel. Isn't you it? could you call them yeah. subjects. Subjects, that would fit with the kingdom, wouldn't it? That is somewhere where the idea of being citizens is there as well, which sounds a bit more like the Republican Front. Yeah. 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 Ye